on World News Tonight, Omicron chaos. Variants of concern make global appearance as countries brace for impact. Drowning nation. India tackles even more attacks of floods as fatal conditions take lives. Nuclear discussions. Ten stocks at the bargaining table as Iran compromises firepower. Christmas cheer. The Bidens display the wealth of gratitude with splendid displays of holiday spirit. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Other Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Anuradhi Wickramasinghe. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. On today's coverage, we start off with updates on the COVID pandemic. President Biden has urged for caution, but not panic, around the new Omicron variant detected globally, stating that the issue must be dealt with responsibly by use of booster shots. This variant is a cause for concern, not a cause for panic. U.S. President Joe Biden urged Americans on Monday not to panic over the new COVID-19 variant known as Omicron and said the United States was working with pharmaceutical companies to make contingency plans if new vaccines were needed. Biden said the country would not go back into lockdowns and promised to lay out his strategy on Thursday for combating the pandemic over the winter. The very day the World Health Organization identified the new variant, I took immediate steps to restrict travel from countries in Southern Africa. But while we have that travel restrictions can slow the speed of Omicron, it cannot prevent it. But here's what it does. It gives us time, it gives us time to take more actions, to move quicker, to make sure people understand you have to get your vaccine. You have to get the shot. You have to get the, get the booster. Biden said it was inevitable that Omicron cases, which were first detected in southern Africa, would soon emerge in the United States. He said officials were still studying Omicron, but believed that existing vaccines would continue to protect against severe disease. But, Biden said his administration was working with vaccine makers Pfizer, Moderna and Johnson & Johnson just in case. And I will also direct the FDA and the CDC to use the fastest process available without cutting any corners for safety to get such vaccines approved and on the market if needed. A U.S. travel ban took effect earlier on Monday, blocking most visitors from eight Southern African nations from entering the country. We are deeply disappointed by the decision of several countries to prohibit travel Despite criticism from leaders in Southern Africa on the new travel restrictions, the White House Monday said the measures weren't about punishing any nation, but about protecting Americans. Biden said the restrictions were intended to buy the country time to get more people vaccinated, despite considerable vaccine hesitancy in the United States, with just 59 percent of all Americans fully vaccinated. Potentially more contagious than earlier strains, the Omicron COVID-19 variant, first identified in South Africa, has now spread to at least 12 other countries, prompting several nations to step up containment measures. Scientists are in a rush against the clock as they try to determine just how dangerous the new coronavirus strain is. First discovered in South Africa, the Omicron variant has shown itself to spread quite quickly. This has caused governments around the world to once again implement travel restrictions as officials hope to contain its spread. The World Health Organization has already classified Omicron as a variant of concern. We don't yet know whether Omicron is associated with more transmission, more severe disease, more risk of reinfections, or more risk of evading vaccines. Scientists at WHO and around the world are working urgently to answer these questions. Scientists are very concerned about the more than 30 mutations in the spike protein, which could affect how infectious the virus is and its ability to evade the body's defenses. Another unknown, how sick do people get with the new variant? Some doctors have been reporting mild symptoms, while others say they've seen some very severe cases in South African hospitals. Scientists say it will take at least two weeks before more concrete information is known about the Omicron variant. 
In the meantime, pharmaceutical companies are already working on new formulations for their vaccines. While public health officials stress, the best protection remains getting vaccinated, wearing a mask, and following social distance guidelines. Australia's National Cabinet will meet to review measures aimed at limiting the spread of the Omicron COVID-19 variant after officials paused the further easing of border restrictions by two weeks. Let's cross over to our Vienna World News Special Correspondent Timothy Phillips reporting from Melbourne in Australia for more. Yes, I'm right. Australia delayed the reopening of its international borders less than 36 hours before international students and skilled migrants were due to be allowed to re-enter the country. The country's health minister, Greg Hunt, said that while delays were being implemented on the presumption that things will recommence from December 15th, authorities will be guided by medical advice during that process. Omicron, dubbed a variant of concern by the World Health Organization, is potentially more contagious than previous coronavirus variants, although there are hopes the variant may be milder than initially feared, calming global financial markets. The new variant was discovered just as Australia was gearing up to reopen its border to foreign visa holders in the latest step to restart international travel, having largely shut its borders in March 2020 to non-citizens. A total of five cases of the newly identified variant, first found in South Southern Africa, have been detected in Australia so far, all vaccinated and in quarantine after genomic tests confirmed three more infections. Back to you, Arnaldi. All right, thank you. That was other than a World News Special Correspondent Timothy Phillips reporting from Melbourne in Australia. The Philippines launched an ambitious drive to vaccinate 9 million people against COVID-19 in three days, deploying security forces and thousands of volunteers in a program made urgent by threats of the Omicron variant. Nine million vaccines in three days. That's the ambitious new campaign launched by the Philippines on Monday. Security forces have been deployed and tens of thousands of volunteers are stepping up to help administer the program. This is the spread of the Omicron variant, described as a variant of concern by the WHO, has sparked global travel restrictions and rattled financial markets. The country's president, Rodrigo Duterte, opened a ceremonial mass vaccination event east of Manila. In San Juan City, Manila residents rolled up their sleeves, some even taking their whole families along to get a shot. The mammoth campaign was scaled back from an earlier target of 15 million shots, but would still be a record in a country where vaccine hesitancy remains an obstacle and there are ongoing logistical hurdles. The Philippines has faced one of the worst COVID-19 outbreaks in Asia and has been slower than many of its neighbours in its vaccine rollout. About 35.6 million people have been fully vaccinated, a third of its 110 million population. In latest reports, the UN's tourism body said that the coronavirus pandemic will cost the global tourism sector about $2 trillion in loss of revenue in 2021, calling the sector's recovery fragile and slow. Tourists have been few and far between in the last couple of years because of the COVID-19 outbreak. The industry has been one of the worst hit sectors. On top of the virus-related travel restrictions, there's been the economic strain caused by the pandemic a spike in oil prices and disruption to supply chains. The UN's World Tourism Organization says the sector has gone from the highs to the lows. The best year in tourism industry, talking about the numbers, numbers of visitors, numbers of revenues, was 2019, and the worst one was 2020. This is clear, and uh, uh, it's historical uh, crisis in tourism industry. The sector remained weak in the first half of this year, but saw an upturn from July to September. The World Tourism Organization says the recovery remains fragile. International tourist arrivals this year globally have been 76% down on 2019 levels. Arrivals in the Americas were 65% down. In Europe, the drop compared to 2019 was 69%, and in Asia-Pacific, a whopping 95%. On an upbeat note, in Europe, the EU Digital Covid Certificate has helped facilitate free movement within the European Union, releasing pent-up demand for travel. The WTO says there are some causes for optimism. There is more knowledge about virus. 
there is more readiness uh, regarding uh, sanitary readiness uh, in many countries. Um, vaccination is there. So there are many new uh, opportunities and digital solutions. On the downside, the organization is warning, however, that uneven vaccination rates worldwide and new COVID-19 strains could impact the already slow tourism recovery. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. Heavy rains across India's southern Tamil Nadu state threw normal life out of gear as the roads got waterlogged, troubling local residents. Let's cross over to other than the world with special correspondent Gayatri Gunasekara reporting from Delhi in India for more. Yes, Sanradi. Schools in most districts of the state were declared shut after the weather department issued an alert. India, with 1.3 billion people, relies on rainfall to support its population, many of whom live rely on farming. But excessive rainfall can cause floods, landslides and waterborne diseases. Officials said heavy rains in India's southern Tamil Nadu state killed at least eight people and caused severe water logging in Chennai city. Waterlogging in Chennai inundated several areas, bringing normal life to a standstill as water entered residential areas. People waded through knee-high waterlogged streets as they struggled to carry out their daily activities. Water pumps were also installed in 127 places of the city to flush out water from the waterlogged areas. Back to you, Anuradhi. All right, thank you. That was other than the World News Special Correspondent Gayatri Gunasekhar reporting from Delhi in India. India's parliament passed a bill to repeal three laws aiming at deregulating agricultural markets, bowing to pressure from farmers who have protested for over a year to demand that the laws be rolled back. After more than a year of camping out along the outskirts of New Delhi, these farmers finally celebrate victory. On Monday, India's parliament repealed the laws on agriculture reform that sparked mass protests. The three laws introduced in September last year were aimed at deregulating the agriculture sector, but growers say they would have destroyed the support structure that guarantees a minimum income and would have left them vulnerable to competition from big business. While the repeal is seen as a win for farmers, they say they'll keep protesting to fulfill other demands, like a law to secure government prices for crops other than just rice and wheat. Unions, meanwhile, are calling for compensation for families of some 750 farmers they say lost their lives during the protests. After strongly defending the laws, Prime Minister Narendra Modi promised to scrap the controversial legislation on November 19. The decision came ahead of next year's elections in key states like Uttar Pradesh and Punjab, both significant agricultural producers. France announced that the EU's border agency is to deploy a plane 24 hours a day over the Channel coast to monitor migrant crossings after pushing its European partners for help in cracking down on people smuggling. After the shock and grief came the promise of action during an emergency meeting in Calais. French, Belgian, German and Dutch representatives have called for a united front against the criminal gang smuggling people to the UK. To try and achieve this objective, the EU Coast Guard agency Frontex will provide a plane to monitor the English Channel. The EU ministers also agreed on the need to strengthen operational cooperation between themselves but also with the UK, whose labour market has become too attractive for migrants. That's according to France's interior minister. UK officials were uninvited to the summit after Prime Minister Boris Johnson published a letter on Twitter which angered France. In the letter, Boris Johnson proposed to send all migrants who land in England back to France. The talks in Calais come after 27 people trying to reach the UK drowned off the coast of France on Wednesday. EU, Iranian and Russian diplomats sounded upbeat as Iran and world powers held their first talks in five months to try to save their 2015 nuclear deal, despite Tehran taking a tough stance in public that Western powers said would not work. The negotiations over Iran's nuclear activities resumed at the Palais Coburg Hotel in Vienna on Monday. It was here that the Iran nuclear deal was signed in 2015. 
Leaving the first session of renewed talks, the European Union's representative appeared optimistic, though accepted the need to adapt to the demands of the new Iranian government. Ultra-conservative Ebrahim Raisi was elected as Iran's president in June. The Iranian delegation represents a new administration in Tehran with new and uh, understandable political sensibilities. But they have accepted that the work done over the six first rounds is a good basis to build our work ahead. Iran is demanding that the United States and Europe lift all the sanctions that have been imposed on Tehran since 2017, including those not linked to its nuclear program. Iran's chief negotiator is waiting for genuine guarantees. The United States is still present at negotiations, though in an indirect capacity, with Iran refusing to meet face to face. Washington Special Envoy Rob Malley accuses Tehran of delaying talks while simultaneously advancing its nuclear program. It's a position shared by Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett. The sanctions imposed on Iran have crushed the country's economy. On the streets of Tehran, residents hold little optimism for the renewed dialogue. Tuesday's meeting in Vienna will be dedicated to discussing the sanctions on Iran, while on Wednesday negotiators will address Iran's return to its 2015 nuclear commitments. If the talks fall through, the idea of a temporary agreement has been floated, in other words, the freezing of Iran's most concerning nuclear activities in exchange for a limited lifting of sanctions. Abortion protests take the front lines in Mississippi as the United States Supreme Court has announced that it is set to hear arguments for debunking the most important precedent for abortion currently in the country. The U.S. Supreme Court is set to hear arguments on Wednesday in the most important abortion case in decades as the state of Mississippi puts up a direct challenge to Roe v. Wade, the 1973 decision that solidified a constitutional right to abortion. If the court overturns Roe, as some supporters fear, it could turn back the clock on abortion access in Mississippi and other states to a time when most of the U.S. criminalized abortion. As a woman who found herself needing an abortion in 1973, it's a time Barbara Phillips remembers well. It was devastating and uh, I, was, I was desperate. Months before she was set to start law school, Phillips was shocked to learn she was pregnant. I was using birth control responsibly. It failed. I'm supposed to be going to Northwestern in, in August and, and I'm pregnant. Then 24, Phillips lived in a small town in Mississippi where the procedure was still not legally available. With help from a feminist group, Phillips traveled to New York for an abortion. I was determined to decide for myself what I wanted to do with my life and with my body. Now 72, she does not regret her decision. Phillips attended Northwestern Law School and became a civil rights lawyer with a long career. Years later, she had a son. But nearly half a century later, Americans are deeply divided on abortion rights. And murder your innocent child. National Right to Life President Carol Tobias said her organization was excited that the Supreme Court had agreed to hear the case. We would love, of course, to see the court take this even further and use it, um, if not to completely overturn Roe, at least as a way to start to overturn Roe because that needs to happen. Um, but we're very excited. Mississippi is among 12 states with so-called trigger laws designed to ban abortion if Roe versus Wade is overturned. More states would likely follow. With U.S. abortion rights under threat, Phillips, like many civil rights advocates, fears the consequences of a return to pre-Roe times. But I'm afraid that many more women and girls will be in back alleys with coat hangers, you know, I, I, I worry we're going to find them on country roads dead. Welcome back. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. France began repatriating some of its nationals from the Ethiopia capital Adi Ababa, with some landing in Paris as fighting intensified between Ethiopian troops and Tigrayan forces. Twitter chief executive officer Jack Dorsey is stepping down from his role and chief technology officer Parag Agrawal, a 10-year veteran of Twitter, will now lead the company. 
Four people, including a foreign national, were killed and 19 others hurt in Istanbul due to extreme winds across Turkey's biggest city and its surrounding regions. Honduran opposition leader Xiomara Castro declared victory in the presidential election as initial results pointed to a landslide win and putting her on track to become the first woman leader of the Central American country. Polish officials accused Belarusian border guards of breaking a selection of Poland-Belarus border fence near Milanik, thus facilitating the passage into EU territory for stranded migrants. And finally tonight, the White House unveiled this year's Christmas decorations based on the theme Gifts from the Heart. This year, the traditional White House gingerbread house in the state dining room included additional buildings that honoured frontline workers and first responders for their contributions during the coronavirus pandemic. The buildings included replicas of a grocery store, post office, hospital and a police station. The official White House Christmas tree in the Blue Room celebrates the gift of peace and unity. According to the White House, it features paper doves that carry a banner with the names of each state and territory of the United States. This year marks the first White House Christmas for the Bidens since taking office. In case you have missed any of the stories we aired tonight, you can re-watch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Suzanne Shanali will join you again tomorrow with another edition of World News. I'm Anuradha Vikramasinghe. Until then, stay safe and have a great night.